Hello, welcome to Biggest Little Library. I'm Amy. And I'm Tammy. We're your personal librarians connecting you with just the right book. Each week we explore a variety of titles that live in the stacks. And this week we have a special guest, Dr. Julie Begby. We talk all things literacy for you and for your kiddos. Alrighty, listeners, grab your library card and let's get to the books. Tammy and I are very excited today. We have one of my favorite human beings at Reno High School. It's Dr. Julie Begby, and she has her doctor in, doctor in what? Can you? Education and literacy studies. So you're a reader. I am, but we're going to talk about that. Yeah, we are. So she's passionate about reading, and we feel very blessed to have her today because we want to pick her brain about um, great things to help your young people in your life read, Mm -hmm. great things to help you read, and why reading matters and how it can impact your life in a positive way. So Dr. B, welcome welcome to the show. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. What an honor. We're super excited. We've had this on our to-do list. I'm not joking. We have a big post-it note over there, and your name's been on it (laughs) since July. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, easily six months. I know. And we actually thought this would be the perfect one to put you in because we knew you were going to drop some titles for us, like oh, yeah. good, good things to read for younger people. Yeah, I'm happy to help. So, okay, tell us a little bit about, you have a doctorate in literacy, mm-hmm. education and literacy. Tell us mm. a little bit about that. Mm. Oh, okay. Uh, well, first of all, I would not recommend getting a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> right off um, the bat. Right off the, that's, yeah. <laughs> but in truth, I'm only one year out from the trauma. Okay. So if you talk to me in five years, I'll probably say, oh, yes, it's fabulous. So right. as of right now, I would say don't do it. Um, and But at the same time, I think in order to talk about the PhD, it's important to talk about my grad school journey. Mm-hmm. Because I was never somebody ever who wanted to go back to college after my bachelor's. Right. I hated college um, the first time around. It felt... Um, contrived. It felt like a waste of money. I felt like I was more prepared to be a teacher just by watching my teachers than I felt when I graduated with my bachelor's in education. You know, you're not the first person to say that. I know. Isn't that, it's just, it's disheartening. Mm -hmm. It is. I remember on the day of graduation, and this is not a lie, I flipped off the school I graduated from as I was driving (laughs) away because I literally felt so terrified that I was supposed to be in the classroom in a month from then to do my student and teaching. Weren't. And I had no idea how to make a photocopy. I didn't know uh-huh. how to use a, what do we used to call that? The, um, the overhead, projector? overhead projector. Oh, right. yeah. I didn't know how to use that. So while I knew some theory about right. education and literacy, I wasn't ready to like be in the classroom. So all of that to say, I almost had a firm stance that I would never go back to college. And I, in that began the, the path to leading me back to college because my teachability went in the toilet Mm. with that attitude. Mm. Wow. And so I, that's honest. Yeah. I mean, I'm Dr. Begbie. I'm very honest. (laughs) Gets me in trouble a lot, but one thing I am is honest. So my teachability went in the toilet because I thought I knew more than what I learned while I was in college the first time. And that attitude caught up to me around my 12th year of teaching when I thought I knew more than the specialists they were bringing in to teach us. I thought I knew more than my principals. And I'm still a baby at the time, right, in my early 30s. But what I was doing was working. My kids were showing growth. My kids were happy. Mm -hmm. I was loving my job. But then, you know, new program here, new admin there, change this, do that. And I just you know, without that teachability and that ability to sort of just roll with it, I, I cracked. So. I, I, I'm really glad you bring this up because I feel like I've, un- I understand this journey because I've been on it myself where you really do feel like you're, you're better than anybody in the room. Yeah. And I think that's a really dangerous place to be. And I remember kind of having a come to Jesus moment mm-hmm. where I'm like, you need to get your head and heart right. Because the second you close off that teachable spirit mm-hmm. in your soul, yes, you become the worst person in the room. I was the worst person in the room. If you worked with me anywhere between 2008 to 2012, I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) It's so true. And it was partly because I was going through a lot of personal things. I had, it was going through divorce. There was a lot happening. But in addition to that, I thought I knew more and it was just a really icky, um, stifling place to be. And so I remember specifically, I'll never forget the day that I knew I needed to go back to school and be teachable again. And it was a student of mine. I was working at the time at a Title I middle school. And my student came in and was talking about how he didn't have his homework that day. And after 12 years of working in Title I schools, I was also losing my grace 
mm-hmm. and my patients. Mm-hmm. So not only was I not teachable with my colleagues and my admin, but my students were suffering because I responded to this kid when he told me that he didn't have his homework because they had to leave their apartment in a hurry last night because they oh got evicted mm-hmm. and he was only allowed to grab a few things and he didn't grab his homework. And instead of responding the way I should have, which was, hey, no big deal. Let's work on it together. I'm so sorry you had to leave in a hurry. Is there anything I can give you? Are you hungry? It was, there's no excuse. My homework was due today. And I had never responded that way. And I saw this little boy's eyes. He didn't cry, but he he cried without crying. And it was because I, I had earned a relationship with him up until that point. And then I severed it in that moment. Oh wow! And it took me the rest of the school year to earn his trust back. And so in that moment, I went home and I thought, if I don't have grace and patience for the circumstances, circumstances that these children are in, then I I can't teach at this school and I can't teach middle school. And that kind of led me down this path of why am I teaching? Why am I doing this? And ultimately what was illuminated for me was I felt so uh, trapped and I felt trapped partly in my own lack of teachability, but also in this idea that I was teaching middle school students with so many reading and writing gaps. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea how to teach them to read or write from like a very basic elementary level because I was trained seventh through 12th grade English. Right. They don't teach teach, that. They don't teach that, especially in the nineties, late nineties and the early two thousands. They didn't teach that at all. It wasn't even thought of that a 10th grade English teacher would have to teach basic literacy. So for me, I realized that I was starting to get um, jaded by my own lack of knowledge of how to teach kids early literacy skills when they were teenagers. And so I went home that night and I started researching colleges that could teach me how to teach kids to read and write from the ground level. Which is amazing because there are teachers who get to that point and then don't do anything to fix it. And I think that happens in education, in my own experience, somewhere between 12 and 15 years. Mm. And you either stay that way and you're that hard-nosed person that doesn't Mm -hmm. make the relationships Mm -hmm. with kids Mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. Or you are the person that goes back and you dig deep and you you Mm -hmm. learn some more things and you start over kind of with your your, um, teaching. And that's where I was when Amy came into my life Hmm. and teaching. It was, I had been with all those educators that were like, don't smile until Christmas, you know, and just really the heart. And I was never that person, but that's all of the colleagues around me and just sort of that harsh, Mm. there's no grace. And I remember the first time Amy said, I think the kids deserve a little grace. I'm like, Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly I, how I, I feel. I gave Tammy yes. permission to be her true self. <laughs> that makes yeah. me want to cry, to be honest, mm-hmm. because that was you being set free. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I feel like, you know, for in a spiritual sense, for me, that m- what I just described to you was my rebirth yeah. Yeah. as an educator. Like you said, it was my chance to not become one of those teachers that just needed to retire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Instead, yeah. it was, you know, now this is my 19th year right now. And I'm like, OK, what else can I learn? How else can I change? Who can I learn from? Can I just tell you something? I mean, like, obviously, when I look at you, you look like you have the experience, right? I don't know what that means, but thank well, you. Well, you. <laughs> look, you look, you have the look of a veteran teacher. Like I can tell because, you know, you're just past 40, but you look great, girl. Like, hey, girl. (laughs) Um, But I will tell you, you do not teach like a veteran teacher. Like your energy and your vibe gives off like somebody in their first five years, which I take that as a a high compliment. Yes. It's a high compliment. So thank you. Yeah. I've seen you teach. Did you know that? Tell me more. You were in here. And I came oh, in, it yeah. was, I could tell you it was March 13th. It was the last day before everything closed with COVID. Oh yeah. And, and you had your kids impeccable. in here. And I came in, Amy had called me. She goes, I think we may close. You might want to come get books. Come now. And I turned my she car around it and I here. beelined it over here <laughs> and you were in here and we met and your kids were in here. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Thank yeah. you. I'm yeah. glad that, I'm glad that we can say we know each other in multiple ways now. <laughs> we are Roy Gom gophers. Yes. And we go for learning. We, <laughs> <laughs> we still do. Yes. Yeah. So then my master's took me to New York city where oh. I had the like tremendous honor to learn from the the educational gurus at Teachers College at Columbia. And basically, I was um, taken down as many pegs as there could possibly be in a person's life because I went in thinking I was, you know, the smartest person in the room and Mm. quickly learned that I was 
not even smart at all, which was beautiful. It was such a great experience <laughs> because I, I never knew how to ask for help. I never knew where to search for the gu- the gurus, the people ahead of me who've done the work. Right. And so there is where I learned that I'm actually just standing on the shoulders of all of the people before us who've done the work. And I thought I was creating it all. And so it was beautiful for me to like strip myself of that sort of pride mm-hmm. and expectation that I was the one creating it all. Instead, it's who can I ask to help me with this so I don't have to spend three weeks trying to right. figure it out. Right. And, and so that experience allowed me to work in... A, an elementary school in Brooklyn. And I was working in there for the semester to be able to watch and learn how to teach kids to read and write from the ground up. And Fascinating. it was, yeah. it was, I was grateful to have 12, year, 12 years of teaching under my belt to right. go in and watch that because I literally could just focus on the skills to teach literacy instead of also figuring out how to, you know, do yeah. discipline yeah, and yeah, classroom yeah. management. And so that experience was um, something that taught me how much I love to learn. And so after I graduated from New York and came back to Reno, I thought, well, what, I just need to keep learning because this is A, so fun, and B, I think – I think maybe I might be onto something here. Right. I didn't know what I was onto. And so I applied for a PhD here at un- the University of Nevada, Reno, and started that five-year journey. And it was brutal, um, but brutal in a different way than New York was because PhDs, you know, whether you get it in rocket science or literacy, you take basically the same, I would say, 70 credits. Mm-hmm. And then the mm-hmm. remaining 30 credits are just in your own field. Mm-hmm. And so you're taking these these stats classes and these research classes with people who are literally changing the world in different ways. And right. that was really um, humbling. Mm-hmm. And it was also really motivating. So I think, you know, because of that, I, I had no idea what my ceiling was for my my knowledge or Mm -hmm. how much I could push myself and the ceiling just kept getting higher and higher because I just kept pushing and pushing, which was, you know, as a teacher, I was constant, I was still in the classroom that whole time. And so I was always telling my students, you know, as we're, we're all students in this room, right? I'm pushing myself at night in night classes and you guys are pushing yourself in the day. And that really kind of helped connect me to the students in a new way. And that was a beautiful experience. That's cool. It is. I love that. That's really cool. Thanks. Joy. Thanks, yeah. guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, my, my PhD is in literacy. My focus of my dissertation is teenagers because teenagers are my life, right. my heart and soul. Um, and then within that is looking at motivation, reading motivation, and seeing if reading motivation can help with their literacy outcomes. And some of my findings, I did a quantitative study, which is not typical for literacy. Most of the time it's a qualitative study. So I was really analyzing a lot of data, which I've grown to love. I used to hate the term data when I was you know, in my lack of teachability state. Is it unteachable? Is that how you say that? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, not always good with the prefixes. I think unteachable so. is the correct way okay, to say so it. So if I was being, when I was in my unteachable state, I hated data because I didn't understand the power of it. Right. And I thought it was just a buzzword and I hated buzzwords. Now I use all the buzzwords. So, you know. Because <laughs> you understand them. Because right? I <laughs> understand the power of them. Yeah. And so analyzing data of my students and just seeing if certain types of reading motivation would help with their literacy outcomes. And it showed that there there is a type of motivation that can. So it's this idea that, there is an intrinsic motivation, which is, you know, inside of you, you want Mm -hmm. this goal, you want to finish the book, you want the A. Intrinsic motivation is beautiful, but if you don't have it, it's extremely hard to create. Right. Mm -hmm. It can't be manufactured. And in education, we're trying to manufacture everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many of your students, when you're looking at your entire set of teenagers that are in front of you, 150, 180 kids, Mm -hmm. how many have actually possessed the intrinsic motivation to be readers? What a great question. Versus the ones that don't. Yeah, I'm just so we have So I have a reading motivation questionnaire that they fill out at the beginning mm-hmm. of the school year, except in a pandemic. I did not give it this year, but we right. can every other year. So they take it a reading motivation questionnaire and it tells them what type of reading motivation they have. So oh. then I can specifically, this is what my dissertation was, I can specifically give them the type of motivation they need wow. in order that. to push so my that intrinsic kids, fabulous. my intrinsic kids, they're setting goals. My extrinsic mm-hmm. kids, I'm giving them reader of the month awards. Right. You know, my social kids are in book clubs. There's just, oh, it's, it's fabulous. Yeah. So it's very specific.
specifically geared wow. motivation tactic tactics. I would love to take the quiz. I'm, I'm happy to give funny. it to you. Me too. I, I know. Like, I we're just. I, I knew you were going to nerd yeah. out with me and be uh-huh. like, can we take it? <laughs> and I also have a writing motivation quiz. So you guys let me know. Yeah. yeah. I would love to see both of them. I'm just fascinated yes, by it. Yes, it is fascinating. Mm-hmm. So what do you think the ratio is? How many are intrinsically motivated? I would suspect it's very small. It's actually, that's incorrect. Typically it's more intrinsic than extrinsic. Really? But think about, oh. think about, okay, I teach 10th graders and 10th graders don't often want to be seen by their peers. They still want to stay under the radar a yeah. bit. Mm-hmm. Now, if I was giving wow. this to eighth graders, I think that the, it, the scales would look different. I think it would be more extrinsic because at that yeah. point, you know, you're kind of quote unquote ruling the school. Right. You have experience right. in, in middle school. You're not new. And so I think a lot of that, they get more comfortable being seen and recognized. Do you think if you had seniors and sophomores, right, and you're giving them the reading motivation for both of them, do you think you would see a a difference because of that mental, like, attitude shift that happens? Because there's a distinct difference between sophomores and seniors. I mean, you guys have more experience with that than I do because I've only taught high school sophomores. Right. But my guess would be yes. That would be my prediction. But I actually think that it would probably be similar as well. Because as we know, the psychology of seniors, senioritis, they just are over it. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to really say. Maybe the first few months of their senior year, they may be more extrinsically motivated because they're excited to be seniors. But then if you gave the same motivation questionnaire in April when they're just over it, Mm -hmm. I have a feeling it may look different. I find it fascinating because I've, I've always taught seniors and sophomores. Mm. That's been my, my gifting. And I feel good in that spot. Even when I have the seniors and the juniors that come down here and we star test them. And then I have that kind of personalized conversation about what does this data mean and how does it, how is it going to inform like what you're doing next in life, especially Mm -hmm. with the seniors? Some of them look at their scores and they have like a, oh crap moment Yes, because they realize they're going, as I would tell my seniors, you're going into college. And if you cannot have the endurance to pick through a piece of really weighty text, Mm -hmm. you're going to struggle. And I'm not telling you that to scare you. I'm telling you that because that's the truth. And I want you to be successful next year. And how do you build that uh, reading skill up? How do you get that muscle mm-hmm. moving? And and so that was a conversation we had a lot. And I, even though I'm not teaching anymore, when the kids come in, I feel like some of them get it. Like the light goes yes. on because I have conversations. They're like, Miss Newberry, did you see my score? And I'm like, well, do you want to tell? Because, you know, there's mm-hmm. thousands of scores that come in. Right. Like, can you tell me your score? And they tell me and I'm like, yep, that's not so great, is it? Like, let's, and they're, they want to genuinely improve it because they know where they're going next. So mm-hmm. I'm just, I think it'd be fascinating. I'd love to see you teach seniors. I'd like to see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Someday. Who knows? Yeah, I know. I think that anytime as readers, um, we have a, a, an understanding of ourselves as a reader more than just, oh, I like to read or I don't like to read. You know, what motivates me? What's my level? You know, uh, what types of books do I gravitate towards? The more data we have about ourselves, the more we're able to make very strategic decisions. And my heart and soul, my muse in life is the unmotivated, the reluctant, the hesitant reader Mm -hmm. or teenager in general. (laughs) I just, I love the kids so much. Who's going to sit in the corner and give me the death stare. I mean, that is my person. And I am like, you're going to win. I'm ready for you. (laughs) I've been waiting all summer. And so, you know, I think in general, just, you know, finding as many different data points that I can give my students and myself about learning about them is empowering. And so, you know, I, I'm not expecting parents to give their, their children necessarily reading motivational quizzes, but just know that there are a lot of tools out there for parents and, and kids to understand themselves as readers. And I've seen you noobs in the library with your genre tasting and all of these different ways that you're trying to get kids to, to understand the complexity of their literacy profile. I just, I really appreciate it. Well, it's funny because when we did that video on reader identity, mm-hmm. Uh, Dawn Callahan came down here and she's like, I can't stop thinking about my own personal reader identity. And I was just, I was struck by the fact that we created a video that was supposed to be for kids. Mm -hmm. But then here's this adult who's a reader, who's an English teacher. And she couldn't, she was like, yeah, she, that was part of her conversation was part of her vocabulary that Mm -hmm. she was having with her kids. And I thought, well, that's interesting because I I think it is fascinating to do that introspection on your absolutely yeah one one of my favorite questions to ask students and then I thought maybe I could ask you guys even though I know you're interviewing me um is my favorite question is tell me tell me about yourself as a reader Mm -hmm. oh Tams I do I love you want me to tell you yes yeah so I really was not a reader until about middle school 
my family, they've all been readers. That's predominantly what my parents did in the evenings. And I was very reluctant until I found a couple of books, a series of books that spoke to me. And then I never quit after that. I've always been a reader. And then I would get in more trouble because I wouldn't do my chores or what my mom wanted me to do because I was sneaking off and reading another chapter or two. And I'd say, oh, one more chapter. And then, you know, I'm trying to finish the book. But I just, it wasn't something I gravitated to. What would your life have looked like had you never found that initial series that kind of pulled you in? I don't know, because as we've talked before, it was historical fiction mm -hmm. and I became a history teacher. That's, you know, I know. I, I mean, so, it's about the fingerprints all over your mm -hmm, life. Mm -hmm. So I like that yeah. fingerprints all over your life. You did, mm -hmm. Well, and if you look back, okay, I read mm -hmm. a book once and I don't even remember what it's called, which is like the worst thing for a librarian to say. <laughs> they talk about how in your life, when you see where you're at right now or what your desires or your heart is, you can look back in your past and see fingerprints of that destiny mm -hmm. all over your life. So Love. that was, mm -hmm. I think that's what that is for you. It is. It is for sure. Oh. What about you? What was the first question? Tell me about yourself as a reader. Okay. So I, my mom, we did not have a ton of money growing up. And I remember, I mean, I would, I wouldn't say I was, you know, poor, but we, you know, struggled. We struggled a lot, but I do remember being a kid in elementary school and she would take me into the scholastic book fairs. Yeah. Mm, and those she'd were let amazing. Me, mm -hmm. Oh, right. Oh, and she's like, you can have anything you want. Wow. And I remember like I got Watership Down. I never read it by the way, because <laughs> it was one of my hard. books. It was, it that's is one of my books. <laughs> it, did you read it this year or are you going no, to read it? No, but that's the book that in middle school that I read. That wow. Made me Fascinating. I got that's Wrinkle in Time. Yes, I got all these one. great books and, she, and I remember her letting me buy those and then she would take me to the teacher store because that's where you'd find YA books back in that time frame in the 70s, 80s. Like they were not, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't a big YA no, market no, at that time. At all. But it's funny because you go to college and your personal reading kind of stops, right? Oh, you're, yeah. you're, mm -hmm. you're, you don't have time for it. And so then you get done with college and I got a job teaching English here and I didn't have time because I was barely hanging on to trying to do the job well. And then I had kids and I didn't have any personal time there. And then I went back to teaching. And this was like the turning point, point for me as an, as an adult. We went to, during finals, we went to lunch. And Terry mm -hmm. said to me during lunch, she's like, so what are you personally reading? And I had this moment of like, oh, no. Because I wasn't. I said, well, I'm grading all the time, Terry. I don't have time to read. I just, right. And he looked at me. He's like, but you're but you love to read and you're an English teacher. And it was like one of those moments, like he didn't say it to me as much as I said it to myself. Like if I'm going to be telling kids that they have to be reading and they have to be writing, then I have to walk my talk. Mm -hmm. It was a switch for me. It was a total switch for me. It was a teachable moment. Mm -hmm. It was like, I need to get my crap together mm -hmm. and be the person that I'm telling these kids that I really am because I'm not that mm -hmm. person. And so that's when I'd say it really started for me again as an adult. And that was probably like 34 Hmm. Was, mm -hmm. you know well and then we read extensively when we yeah. team taught together and gave book talks all the time mm. and read the books that we thought the kids would be interested in and then they did become interested in them because we had that enthusiasm yeah. for them and so and I will tell you um when I went to McQueen to teach I wanted Gabe in my classroom I really designed that sophomore curriculum around reluctant boy readers like all the books were very geared Good. toward that type of reader because I knew my son was that and then my husband said he would read every book with Gabe. And I saw the power of parents engaging in a conversation yes. with their kid about a book. Now, obviously, I was Gabe's teacher, so he was not as enthralled with me knowing about the book because I was the expert in the room. But having watching he and Kevin have this conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. about Alas Babylon or 1984, and they still have moments where they're like, remember that one book, like they still do that. And I think that that's very powerful for, for students. Well, and research shows that if, if kids are seeing the male figure in their lives reading, the kind of push that it gives them into reading is monumental. And wow. part of that, one of the most re like fascinating parts of research for me that I've learned is that, um, High schoolers and middle schoolers think that reading is gendered. They think it's female. So that's part of why boys are reluctant in their adolescence is because if they think back through their life, who is the one who's mostly reading to them? Women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mom. Because mom 
mom or mother figure yeah. or their teachers are often female, female in elementary school. Their librarian mm-hmm. is often female. And if there is a male in the school, they aren't necessarily known as the person you go to to talk about books. And so there's this huge gap from, but I'm a boy and I only see girls reading. And then when I go into the library, I feel like most fiction books are For geared girls. toward girls. I don't see myself accurately represented in literature for boys. That's so there's, there's a huge shift. Yeah. <laughs> Look at mm-hmm. our faces. There's a huge shift in the last, I'd say, 20, 30 years, recognizing that that's how boys are feeling. And so that's where you're seeing the rise of the graphic novel, which I am the most gigantic fan of. Oh, huge. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's the rise of the different archetypes in YA literature for boys and trying to pull in different narratives that have not been represented or represented accurately right. in, in literature. So I think, you know, we just assume if you look at kind of our, our bias or our, our stereotypes is that boys want to read nonfiction and girls want to read fiction. But part of the reason why they want to read nonfiction is because they can't see themselves in the fiction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh man, that is, that is kind of terrifying. It is terrifying. So as parents and teachers, it's just, you know, making sure that they see everybody in the family reading male, female, grandparents, you know, ages, all of that, different ages that matters and making sure that you're picking not your kind of stereotypical right books for boys and stereotypical books for girls it's you know as a family let's pick a book and we're gonna read it together or we're gonna listen to an audiobook on the car ride every day to school and it's gonna be a genre that we're not used to Mm -hmm. I find that fascinating because I feel like our principal has especially this year has really ramped up his reading game and he's told me that he sits down every night and reads in his son's room. Yeah, that is extremely powerful. And I'm like, I look at him, I'm like, A plus on your parenting. Well, A plus to him all around. I all mean, the way around. Yes, he's all, the best. He is. But a, like, I just thought that is probably so powerful for your son. Probably more powerful than you even realize. Oh, yeah. yeah. That you're sitting there. In fact, he said one time his son looked up and goes, that was way longer than 20 minutes. And he's like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, you trick him a little bit to read longer, but... I just, I think that there's such value in in that. It's amazing. Well, if you think back to when we were kids, you know, and think about what our father figures were reading, it was often the newspaper. Yeah. Or they were watching war type shows on TV. Yeah. You know, that's kind of a stereotypical middle upper class white person's situation back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. But nowadays it's about being intentional, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing the, the more you know, the more you know. And the more you don't know. And so now that we know that boys can see that reading is gendered, we're trying to make sure that everyone is reading, but you're also reading diverse things. It's not just the newspaper. Right. Or, you know, I grew up seeing my dad read the Bible every day and I saw him reading the newspaper, but he wasn't a major avid reader when I was a kid. He loved to watch TV about history. Now he's an avid reader. You know, and I think if I had been a kid who saw my father reading all the time, I, I can guarantee you that would have that would have changed something in me. I don't know what necessarily, right. but it would have changed something in me and it would have allowed it. Maybe it would have just created space to have book talks yeah, with my dad, which yeah. would have been I th- anything like that as powerful with any of your parents. But I think just again, knowing that they need to see everyone reading. That's amazing. That's such is. good advice. Ugh. So Julie, how about for um, our listeners at home, how might they encourage their kids or teenagers to be readers? So I think it's important to keep in mind that when kids are in elementary school, parents often see reading as um, a hobby. Mm -hmm. But then the minute that kids become adolescents, reading becomes a chore or in some cases a punishment. Hmm. Oh, that's so true. And so we've, we've unknowingly made reading surrounded by pressure and a punitive type of punishment. You go, you, you're being a jerk, go read for 20 minutes. Or you need to go cool down, go read. You know, or have you done your reading yet? Where's your reading log? It, it's just, and we don't even mean it. We don't even realize right, it. Right. But as a kid, it's, you know, you're a little person, your six-year-old is reading at the table and you're listening and you're giggling and you're answering questions along with them. But when they're older, they go, you send them to their room to read. Yeah, it's true. And come out when you're done. So instead it's, you know, kind of how do we continue the space that we create for elementary students 
for teenagers. Yeah. Can they read on the couch? Can they talk about what they're reading? Can they read out loud? Yeah. You know, are you asking yeah. questions at, at, about the, at the end of the chapter? Hey, what just happened? We know that a lot of students struggle with reading comprehension. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it can be a simple, hey, just tell me what took place in that chapter. Yeah. And having them, you know, kind of talk it out with you is a huge help in, in a comprehension. So just creating a space that is safe for reading reading. at home Mm -hmm. that is celebrated. And then first and foremost, let your kid pick what they want to want to read for the love. Right. I'm so, I mean, I'm all about knowing your reading level. And I, I mean, I learned from Lucy Calkins at Columbia and she's the guru in terms of, you know, reading at your level and reading books at your level. But you also have to read books you like. Yes. And if you're only reading books at your level and your level is fourth grade and you're a ninth grader, so you're reading books that you feel are baby books. Right. Mm -hmm. Then how often are you going to want to read when you Mm -hmm. constantly being reminded that you read at a baby book level? I feel like this is the thing um, that makes me feel bad about my teaching is that I assigned so many. And, And not that there's not a space to do that in your teaching, but I assigned so many books that kids weren't ready for Mm -hmm. or may never be ready for, for whatever reason, because that was what I was given to teach or that was like the standard curriculum. And, you know, I, I read Grapes of Wrath as a junior and I hated it. I spark noted my way through, it was cliff notes back then, (laughs) let's be honest. I hated it. And then I read it again. I taught it as a young 20 something year old and I hated it. But then something happened when I hit 37 and my book club wanted to read it. I read it and it, it ripped my heart apart. It was so good. And I thought, oh my God, well, now I'm ready for it. It's like, what have I done to all these kids? Well, and I think, so Penny Kittle is one of the greatest researchers. I love for, Penny oh Kittle. Oh yeah, she's everything. And so she did this video where she's asking her students, because she's a, a teacher researcher, which is also what I am. So we are researchers in the classroom. Right. Which is rare. I wish it wasn't so rare. Right. Um, but uh, so she did a video with her students where she asked how many books they had read in a one year span of time. And, you know, most of them are saying two one, many kids said zero. Yeah. And then you, of course you've got your kids who say 14 and then she, she allowed them to, and then she asked, I'm sorry, she asked, uh, how many books did you finish with your English teacher last year? And nearly every kid said they spark noted their way through oh, yeah. Yeah. or they mm-hmm. listened to their peers talk and kind of went off that, mm-hmm. but they were admitting that they weren't actually into or interested in the books that were given. So then she mixed it up for that school year and allowed them to pick any book they wanted to read and asked them midway through the year, how many books have you read in one semester? And the change was 16 books. I just read 24 books in one semester. I mean, kids who were saying they read one book in 12 months were now reading 14 books in one semester. And they, and she said, what is the difference? And the kids answered over and over, you let us pick what we wanted to read. Mm-hmm. So as we know, whether you're a parent or a teen, a parent of teenagers or a teacher of teenagers, teenagers need options. Right. Yes. You tell them what to do, they shut down, and they they raise their middle finger at you, <laughs> fig- figuratively or literally. Mm-hmm. And right, right. If you give them the choice, the choice is everything. So my next piece of advice for parents and teachers is please don't tell the students or the kids everything they have to read. Right. Sure, there should be a required reading, but overall, if you want kids to have an authentic reading identity, a true safe space that it needs to be books that they want that are either at their level or not. And they can reread books. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like we rewatch movies. It's the bizarrest thing when I hear teachers say, you know, you cannot reread a book. Or how about a book that has a movie? Or a book that has a movie. I don't understand I don't understand any of that. (laughs) To me, if there's anything that's speaking to you, there's a reason. So listen. Yeah. I like to reread a book. Same. so I don't know, you know, yeah, don't kids know. would too. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. I know, especially if it's something they're comfortable with and this they're secure with. I would have kids that would say, I want to read Harry Potter over again. And I'm like, how many times you, you know, I, that's a great place to have a dialogue mm-hmm. about why they love the book and how many times they've read it. But I agree with you. I'm a hundred percent on like, I just want you reading words. Yes. I don't care where those words are coming from. So how do we, what do we have to give, what tool can we give to parents about helping their kids pick books then that are yeah. good for them? Where do, so how do they do that? I, I always feel uncomfortable when there's this idea that a parent is going to pick a book for anyone besides right. for themselves. Right. Right. Reading is so personal. So if you have an, a reluctant or hesitant reader at all and you go and pick books for them, they're not going to read them. 
ever. You're right. If you've right. got a hesitant, reluctant reader, they have to choose their own. And I don't care, again, if they choose Diary of a Wimpy Kid, because like you said, noobs, it's a safe, it's a safe space. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There has to be an entry point. So whatever that entry point is that's safe, whether it's graphic novels or a reread, whatever, that's the entry point. And then give them six months. And at that point, you can start buying books that they would actually enjoy because now they know themselves so, as a, a reader. Would you recommend, like if somebody's trying to get their kid into reading and they want to find them a book, would you say, okay, parent or responsible adult that's in charge of this kid, go to the bookstore. What what, what would you say? Like, how, how are they going to find that entry point? Like, so oftentimes, uh, hesitant, reluctant readers don't find going to the bookstore enjoyable like us nerds do. Okay. (laughs) So, you know, Hey, let's go to Sundance. They're going to look at the music, which they do have cool records and stuff, Yeah. but they're, (laughs) they aren't going to gravitate towards the books because again, there's a, there's that, there's a hesitancy. That's why I like to call them hesitant readers is because we walk in and it's like a Mecca. We want to grab and touch everything. Right. They don't want to touch anything because a, they may have a low reading level and so they don't. They don't know what to read because they don't know what they can read. Or B, the last several books they've read are the forced upon them books from their English class. Right. So my advice is I wouldn't take them to the bookstore. I wouldn't ask them what book they want for Christmas. Instead, it's, hey, let's go to your bookshelf. Let's find a book you've already read. Let's do it again. Okay. That's great. That's the entry point. That's the entry point. I love that. That's really good advice. And it costs them nothing. (laughs) Right. It costs them nothing. Unless they don't have any books, which does sometimes happen. Oh, yes. That's very common. Yeah. So in that case, it would be just the discussion of, you know, in your second, third grade class, what was a book you remember that you really loved? And then you head to the library for them. Right. right? Don't take them there because they're going to have a panic attack. Right. Take, go and get the book and check it out from the library. Okay. I love that. Okay. So here's a question that I want to know. Um, in your room, I've seen your library, which I love and I support. Well, that's because you gave me 95% (laughs) of the books. Thank you. (laughs) I know whenever I'm weeding, I'm like, let's see what Jules wants. I want them all because every time. Yeah. Okay. So what are like uh, five titles that you feel like are just can't miss titles? Like they, you, they go out, they get good responses. They go out and they come back fast because kids are kind of devouring them. So what would you say? Most of those books whether I was teaching middle school or high school are the same, which to me is interesting. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. curious. So yeah. it's going to be A Child Called It. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. I have 10 copies over there. Okay, Wonder. 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 Okay. okay. The Harry Potter series, of course. Of course. Diary of a Wimpy Kid. I know. And again, I'm teaching 10th graders, but they, here's the thing that I think is important. And I feel this way about my own reader identity. I need books I can consume. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't need something that's going to take me a month. I want something that's going to be done in a week. And so I think it's really important for us to allow kids to consume. And so I think that's the power of a diary of a wimpy kid or a graphic novel is they can, they can be reading extremely complex themes and, and plots, but done so in a way that is meant to be accessible and meant to be consumed. And so I think, you know, that's why I, I'm always a supporter of, of, Books like A Diary of a Wimpy Kid or the graphic novel is because they're done. I call that about completing books. Okay, so I call that stalling. There are certain books in my year that I stall out over, you know, and I'm a good reader. Yeah. Right. In fact, the one that I was preparing for our next book talk, I Mm -hmm. stalled out like midway through and I really had to kind of push myself. And I find I have found in the last couple of years, especially because we're reading with very intentional purpose for the podcast that if I get stuck behind something I'm stalled in, it pushes everything out of whack. Mm-hmm. And I don't like that feeling. It feels like, okay, should I, then I have this internal conversation of like, should I just abandon this book? Should I pick something else, else up that's going to get me through it faster? Because if I can't, or should I push through? Because sometimes I think it's worthwhile to push through. I mean, there's, there's advantages to doing both abandoning Agreed. and pushing through. But I hate it when I get stalled. And in fact, I only have like five more pages <laughs> in this thing with you for next mm-hmm. week. And I'm like, this damn book has stalled me and it's stalled <laughs> and it, it ruins my flow. Yes. yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause I can get on and I'm like, I read one, two, three a week. And then I get stalled behind something and I don't get to something for three more weeks. Right. It pisses me off. I feel like I understand that. I think every reader understands what you're talking about. We have empathy for that. And I think it'd be helpful now that we're saying this to have a section in our library classroom and school libraries that are for books that you can just consume. Yeah. And I think we should think of a cool name for it. I'm sure there already is one. We can find it. But just this idea like, hey, you want to have a book that is going to 
keep you out of the depth of these deep thoughts and deep yeah. themes. And it's just enjoyable. It's just entertaining. And you could be probably done in a few days. I mean, I'm here for that right now. I, I you know, yeah. when you, if you ask me what kind of reader I am right now, I am just about, I, I will only consume it if it's fast because I am still recovering from reading Your academic PTSD. writing <laughs> and r- academic writing is so, so dense that mm-hmm. it takes years to recover from. So if it's not, if it's not something I can consume with little right. thought and a quick amount of time, I'm not interested in it. Yeah. And there's a lot of kids like that. I was just going to mention this series by Gabrielle Lord called Conspiracy 365. And it was a series, it's, it's a 12 book series where each book is a month and this overarching plot, you know, is it's in each month, but then in the entire year. Wow. And what I liked about the books for reluctant readers is that it counted down the pages. So when oh, I, I would hand that. it to a boy genius. and we would talk about the January, what was going to happen in the January and I'd say, but look. And, and they're like, it goes backwards. I said, yeah, it counts you down. Because you know, kids that. are always like, how many pages? I thought it was genius, it's genius. for that way of consuming a book mm-hmm. that you were just talking about. Mm-hmm. So creating a genre, a space, a space for where kids, again, for our hesitant, our reluctant readers, that they know that that's a safe area because my guess is that those books are probably also written at various levels mm-hmm. so that you've got, you know, you're kind of breaching a bunch of those those um hindrances all in one book yes yeah and let's be honest when I got on a treadmill I'd rather start at 30 <laughs> and go backwards than start at one because I right. want to get off at three <laughs> right mm-hmm. right so true exactly okay so let's go to some personal yes. I want to ask you some personal questions what are you currently reading right now speaking of consuming I'm in a stalling book I think oh, I gosh. is it the one that's on your yes. bookshelf no. Okay. Well, I mean, on your little placard that's yes. outside. Okay. What are you reading? Okay. So I am reading A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. Mm-hmm. And I'm only reading that because one of my freshmen recommended it to me. <laughs> and she was so in love with it. And I, I've always heard of it. Right. Yeah. And I worked yeah. in Brooklyn. So I thought, okay, maybe I need to uh, attach to some schema. I lived there. It'll be fun. It'll get me interested in reading again. It's beautiful writing. I'm halfway through. I've been halfway through for about six weeks <laughs> and I haven't read anything in the meantime. Yeah. Cause yeah. it stalls you. It stalls me. But then I think it's really, I think it's very important to honor the fact that yeah. in your job, if you have to read for your job, mm. you have to count that as a part of your reader identity. I, I, I have a hard time when people are like, what are you personally reading? like your principal said to you back then. I think that's important, but I think it's important to look at the comprehensive reader. And all day long in my job, I am reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I just got off of grad school of reading. So what is my personal reading makes me want to have a panic attack (laughs) because what do you mean? I'm reading constantly. My eyeballs are exhausted every day from reading, but if I'm not reading something personal, it doesn't count. Right. So I think mm-hmm. it's important to, yeah. to give credence to all the ways we're reading throughout the day. Um, think about lawyers. Think about there's so many jobs where all you're doing is reading. That's yeah. True. And we want to honor that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyways, I'm reading A Tree Grows in Brooklyn and it's hard, but I'm going to finish it. I know and you I are. cannot add anything in the middle until I finish it. That's what I do. Yes. That's why I get stalled. But it's sitting right next to my couch and it stares at me every day. And I know that I'm going to get over the hump. And then when I get over the hump, it's going to be just downhill and I'm going to love it. Yeah. But I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. That's the book. My daughter, my older daughter, Taryn, who's 25, continually says to me, when are you going to read that? When are you going to read it? It's so wonderful. And it's just not the book that floats to the top for me no, to it read. it doesn't. No. Mm-hmm. But I think, I think when I'm done and then when you're done, we need to have a conversation about it. Because there has to be something that these younger women are really gravitating toward. And me as an English teacher, I'm kind of stuck on the writing and the writing is beautiful, but it's very typical writing from 1925 Mm -hmm. and I'm over that, (laughs) you know, I'm kind of enjoying these vignette chapters of the the more current uh, fiction, but all that to say, there has to be something that these younger women are gravitating toward. I just haven't found it yet. (laughs) (laughs) It's there though. I know it has to be. Okay. uh, Top five fave books. 
I know that's a hard one to ask a reader because I feel like it always changes for me. So I don't have a top five fave books, but I can give you a combination of fave authors and okay, fave books. Okay, that works. So as you know already, my favorite author of all time is Francine Rivers. And I Francine know. Rivers is um, a historical Christian fiction author. And what I love about her is she first got her, her start in writing um, exotic Oh. No, I meant erotic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, erotic. Well, when I saw so. that you said your favorite book was Redeeming Love yes. by Francine yes. Rivers, I'm like, all of a sudden I knew we were soul sisters. Speak. I haven't read her. Oh, for the love. I haven't read her, but I'm like, oh, Christian author. I hate I'm like, that you just is, said that. I know I, I'm going to. I'm going to. I actually, I'll put it on my 21 for 21. Okay. But I have to tell you. What? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you all about that okay. soon. Dang that, Bell. Hey, just to remind us where we are. <laughs> and I, that's why I said exotic instead of erotic, because my brain is in school mode. I know. So, but I when thought I, you were doing it on purpose. No, but I mean, let's just pretend I was. <laughs> so I'm going to read it. Please read it. Okay, so um, Francine Rivers is... She actually is a graduate of the University of Nevada, Reno. She really? got her de- her writing degree here, which is fabulous. Wow. And she lives just over the hill in, in Sac in that area. Mm-hmm. But she writes her. So her writing, first and foremost, is what I love. And then secondly, I love her topics. Right. But she is a historical fiction, which like you, Tams, mm-hmm. I hope I can call you Tams. You can. Um, <laughs> is my favorite also. That's my genre. Yeah. Historical fiction. It's but my jam. I'm also adding memoir to my favorite. I know, right? Stop yes. it right now. I know. Are very recently. okay. So are, I wonder I'm if just, that's a natural progression. We should do some research. I don't know, but I will tell you that we're starting the year for our. You know what? What we're going to be doing is going to be hello. My name is. And it's going to be a memoir, like Love. podcast on memoirs. Love. So, um, so you had asked me what book I'm looking forward to. Well, it just came out. So, A Promised Land by President Barack yes. Obama. Yes, I am really looking forward to reading that. I although, can check that out for you. I would love that. I have it on hold at Sundance, but oh. I would also. Well, like you probably to want to it. own the first edition. Yes. I get that. Um, I heard though that it's just his first four years in in the White House and it's seven hundred pages. So, mm-hmm. you know, wow. that might be a stall or two. <laughs> He's got a lot to say. Um, anyways, my um, back to my favorite book. So Francine Rivers, anything by her is my absolute favorite. And I highly recommend you don't have to be a Christian to like her stuff. Right. Just saying. Um, okay, then other faves would be crawdads, obviously. Come on, one the of my crawdads favorite. Crawdads by Delia Owens. Yes. Okay, interesting. I thought... Everybody loves that book. I don't even know if I could tell you why I love it so much, but I just do. I thought the writing was fabulous. It's her freshman book, which to me is to come out of the gates like that. I'm just like, oh. Did you read Where the Crawdads Sing? I have not. Ouch. Several people have told me, you have to read it, you have to read it. But it becomes one of those that I think when it hits and it's popular and you don't have the copy to start like everybody else is doing it, then it kind of seems to go down the list. So it's You know what it is? It's the water cooler um, uh, theory. Yes. So when everybody's Mm -hmm. reading it, you're kind of standing around the water cooler having a call. Oh, did you like this? Did you like that's what happens. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't get in on the water cooler experience, mm-hmm. it does slide down further on the list. That's How do we right. fix the water cooler list though? I, yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, part, you know, part of my reader, right. Reader identity is that I get overwhelmed easily with a list of books to read. I don't do well with that. If people right. are like, Oh, you have to read this. Oh, you have to read this. I just automatically feel my type a plus personalities like pressure, pressure. Right. So I try my best to not listen when people tell me what to read and I want it to just naturally fall into my hands. So Tam's at some mm-hmm. point crawdads is going to naturally fall into your hands okay. yes. and then it's okay. going to be time there you all go. right there you go okay my other faves would be i love rupee cower and her poetry okay and because it's digestible kids love easily it easily digestible mm-hmm. kids love it yeah. it's a little bit naughty it which is. is fun but it's it's so deep it, basically it can be as surface level or as in-depth as you want it to be and okay. i dig that and then i'm a jane austen fan Okay, good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, Persuasion go. is yeah. my favorite Jane Austen. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Do you like the movie adaptations too? Mm, yes. Yes. Okay. But I also just, I mean, Downton Abbey is my favorite movie show of all time. Oh, so I like, oh, I mean, I come on. I know. I know. <laughs> it's the, this time of year, I rewatch the whole six seasons every year, no matter what. Yeah. So, I mean, I just dig, we're English teachers or we're educators, right? And so yeah. I think we just like that whole thing. I do. Uh, like anything put out by BBC right. or that is in that demographic. Right. <laughs> watch it. Right. Kevin's like, are you watching another Brit lit? I'm like, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. So yes, I'm a Jane Austen fan and I do like the adaptations. And then lastly, I'm also my reading is also um self-helpy kind mm-hmm. of psychology type things and so i'm including the book attached 
Who's that by? I don't know that one. Oh, no. I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, I'll look maybe it up. Someone we'll put can it look in the show up. notes. Yeah, okay, we'll thank you. But basically, it's a um, psychology book explaining our attachment styles and how there are several different types of attachments. And if you're noticing patterns in your relationships, whether it's, you know, friendships or, I mean, relationships of all kinds, if you're noticing that you're kind of always the one... I don't know, chasing after the Mm -hmm. friends or your relationships kind of are ending the same ways. Mm -hmm. It's because you keep attaching to the same kind of uh, of personalities and they aren't able to remain attached to you. Interesting. And so, you know, I'm always trying to learn about my and better myself physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. And so I found that book to be extremely illuminating Mm -hmm. and not just, again, not just in um, relationships with your, you know, your significant and others but in general like why do I keep putting so much effort into all these things and then they just yeah. don't last yeah and I always want to make it about me and I'm learning that maybe it's not entirely about me it's about who I'm trying to attach to and so it was I highly recommend that book as well oh excellent mm-hmm. yeah it looks really good I just looked it up and I've talked I've actually did. shared that with <laughs> students before because mm-hmm. I had one particular student last year who was like I just keep finding the same type of boyfriend and I don't know why it always ends the same way I'm like honey there's actually a reason here we'll read this book so she read it and it's it's definitely a level for high schoolers yeah and mm-hmm. she was like oh my god that just changed my life <laughs> wow and, and that, I said, girl, and same. that's what books, yeah. and that's what books do. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, yeah, they change your life. Mm-hmm. Well, Julie, Dr. B, as I like to call you, thank you so much for coming and, and just sharing your wisdom and sharing your the truth. I think like your truth about how we engage in our own reading process and how we engage, how we get the people that we love, um, maybe even more specifically, like the young people in our life to love reading, like how we can encourage that and foster that and hopefully inspire that in others. So I just really appreciate your time today. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me. I do too. Thank you for coming. I just really feel enlightened. I know. um, You know what? It makes me really miss, I miss education, but I miss even more now in our conversation being in the classroom with the kids. Well, I'm sure your kids miss having you, Tams. Oh, thank Aww. you. It's true. <laughs> we wish you a Merry Christmas. Thank Happy you. New Year. Happy Festivus for the rest of us. Yes. Happy Hanukkah, whatever it is that Kwanzaa. you All the things. Yes. Yes. Happy All Kwanzaa. the things. Yes. All the things. Just happy. Ali Bosch. All yeah. the things. <laughs> yes. All the things. So um, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for spending time with us today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion with Dr. B about all things reading. Join us next week for our last episode for the year. We'll be taking a break for the holidays and have a fresh new season for you in January. That's right. We're looking forward to that. Also, make sure to head over to biggestlittlelibrary.net for all things to inspire your reading life. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. We'd love it if you would subscribe and leave us a rating too. If you haven't followed us on social media yet, we're going to step that up in 2021. So find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Biggest Little Library. See See you in the stacks. stacks.